Book One, Chapters Twelve through Fifteen of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hollis Hanover. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One, by Flavius Josephus. Translated by William Whiston, Book One, Chapter Twelve through Fifteen. Chapter Twelve Concerning Abimelech, and concerning Ishmael, the son of Abraham, and concerning the Arabians, who were his posterity. Abraham now removed to Gerar of Palestine, leading Sarah along with him, under the notion of his sister, using the like dissimulation that he had used before, and this out of fear. For he was afraid of Abimelech, the king of that country, who did also himself fall in love with Sarah, and was disposed to corrupt her. But he was restrained from satisfying his lust by a dangerous distemper which befell him from God. Now when his physicians despaired of curing him, he fell asleep, and saw a dream, warning him not to abuse the stranger's wife. And when he recovered, he told his friends that God had inflicted that disease upon him by way of punishment for his injury to the stranger, and in order to preserve the chastity of his wife, for that she did not accompany him as his sister, but as his legitimate wife, and that God had promised to be gracious to him for the time to come, if this person be once secure of his wife's chastity. When he had said this, by the advice of his friends, he sent for Abraham, and bid him not to be concerned about his wife, or fear the corruption of her chastity, for that God took care of him, and that it was by his providence that he had received his wife again without her suffering any abuse. And he appealed to God and to his wife's conscience, and said that he had not any inclination at first to enjoy her, if he had known she was his wife. But since, said he, thou lettest her about as thy sister, I was guilty of no offense. He also entreated him to be at peace with him, and to make God propitious to him, and that if he thought fit to continue with him, he should have what he wanted in abundance, but that if he designed to go away, he should be honorably conducted, and have whatsoever supply he wanted when he came thither. Upon his saying this, Abraham told him that his pretense of kindred to his wife was no lie, because she was his brother's daughter, and that he did not think himself safe on his travels abroad without this sort of dissimulation, and that he was not the cause of his distemper, but was only solicitous for his own safety. He said also, that he was ready to stay with him. Whereupon Abimelech assigned him land and money, and they covenanted to live together without guile, and took an oath at a certain well called Beersheba, which may be interpreted the well of the oath, and so it is named by the people of the country unto this day. Now in a little time Abraham had a son by Sarah, as God had foretold to him, whom he named Isaac, which signifies laughter. And indeed they so called him, because Sarah laughed when God said that she should bear a son, she not expecting such a thing as being past the age of childbearing, for she was ninety years old and Abraham a hundred. So that this son was born to them both in the last year of each of those decimal numbers, and they circumcised him upon the eighth day, and from that time the Jews continue the custom of circumcising their sons within that number of days. But as for the Arabians, they circumcise after the thirteenth year, because Ishmael, the founder of their nation, who was born to Abraham of the concubine, was circumcised at that age, concerning whom I will presently give a particular account with great exactness. As for Sarah, she at first loved Ishmael, who was born of her own handmaid Hagar, with an affection not inferior to that of her own son. For he was brought up in order to succeed in the government. But when she herself had borne Isaac, 
she was not willing that Ismael should be brought up with him, as being too old for him, and able to do him injuries when their father should be dead. She therefore persuaded Abraham to send him and his mother to some distant country. Now, at the first, he did not agree to what Sarah was so zealous for, and thought it an instance of the greatest barbarity to send away a young child and a woman unprovided of necessaries. But at length he agreed to it, because God was pleased with what Sarah had determined, so he delivered Ismael to his mother, as not yet able to go by himself, and commanded her to take a bottle of water and a loaf of bread, and so to depart, and to take necessity for her guide. But as soon as her necessary provisions failed, she found herself in an evil case, and when the water was almost spent, she laid the young child, who was ready to expire, under a fig tree, and went on further, so that he might die while she was absent. But a divine angel came to her, and told her of a fountain hard by, and bid her take care, and bring up the child, because she should be very happy by the preservation of Ismael. She then took courage upon the prospect of what was promised her, and, meeting with some shepherds, by their care she got clear of the distresses she had been in. When the lad was grown up, he married a wife by birth an Egyptian, from whence the mother was herself derived originally. Of this wife were born to Ismael twelve sons, Nabioth, Kedar, Abdil, Mabsam, Idumas, Masmaus, Masaus, Chodad, Theman, Jetur, Naphesus, Cadmus. These inhabited all the country from Euphrates to the Red Sea, and called it Nabatim. They are an Arabian nation, and name their tribes from these, both because of their virtue, and because of the dignity of Abraham their father. Chapter 13 Concerning Isaac, the legitimate son of Abraham now Abraham greatly loved Isaac, as being his only begotten, and given to him at the borders of old age by the favor of God. The child also endeared himself to his parents still more by the exercise of every virtue, and adhering to his duty to his parents, and being zealous in the worship of God. Abraham also placed his own happiness in this prospect, that, when he should die, he should leave this his son in a safe and secure condition which accordingly he obtained by the will of God, who being desirous to make an experiment of Abraham's religious disposition toward himself, appeared to him and enumerated all the blessings he had bestowed on him, how he had made him superior to his enemies, and that his son Isaac, who was the principal part of his present happiness, was derived from him. And he said that he required this son of his as a sacrifice and holy oblation, Accordingly, he commanded him to carry him to the mountain Moriah, and to build an altar, and offer him for a burnt offering upon it, for that this would best manifest his religious disposition towards him, if he preferred what was pleasing to God, before the preservation of his own son. Now Abraham thought it was not right to disobey God in anything, but that he was obliged to serve him in every circumstance of life, since all creatures that live enjoy their life by his providence, and the kindness he bestows on them. Accordingly he concealed this command of God, and his own intentions about the slaughter of his son from his wife, as also from every one of his servants, otherwise he should have been hindered from his obedience to God. And he took Isaac, together with two of his servants, and laying what things were necessary for a sacrifice upon an ass, he went away to the mountain. Now the two servants went along with him two days, but on the third day, as soon as he saw the mountain, he left those servants that were with him till then in the plain. And having his son alone with him, he came to the mountain. It was that mountain upon which King David afterwards built the temple. Now they had brought with them everything necessary for a sacrifice, excepting the animal that was to be offered only. Now Isaac was twenty-five years old, and as he was building the altar, he asked his father what he was about to offer, since there was no animal there for an oblation. To which it was answered, 
that God would provide himself an oblation, he being able to make a plentiful provision for men out of what they have not, and to deprive others of what they already have, when they put too much trust therein, that therefore, if God pleased to be present and propitious at this sacrifice, he would provide himself an oblation. As soon as the altar was prepared, and Abraham had laid on the wood, and all things were entirely ready, he said to his son, O son, I poured out a vast number of prayers that I might have thee for my son. When thou wast come unto the world, there was nothing that could contribute to thy support for which I was not greatly solicitous, nor anything wherein I thought myself happier than to see thee grown up to man's estate, and that I might leave thee at my death the successor to my dominion. But since it was by God's will that I became thy father, and it is now his will that I relinquish thee, bear this consecration to God with a generous mind. For I resign thee up to God, who has thought fit now to require this testimony of honor to himself, on account of the favors he hath conferred on me, in being to me a supporter and defender. Accordingly, thou, my son, wilt now die, not in any common way of going out of the world, but sent to God, the Father of all men, beforehand by thine own Father, in the nature of a sacrifice. I suppose he thinks thee worthy to get clear of this world, neither by disease, neither by war, nor by any other severe way, by which death usually comes upon men but so that he will receive thy soul with prayers and holy offices of religion, and will place thee near to himself, and thou wilt there be to me a succorer and supporter in my old age, on which account I principally brought thee up, and thou wilt thereby procure me God for my comforter instead of thyself. Now Isaac was of such a generous disposition as became the son of such a father, and was pleased with this discourse, and said that he was not worthy to be born at first, if he should reject the determination of God and of his Father, and should not resign himself up readily to both their pleasures, since it would have been unjust if he had not obeyed, even if his Father alone had so resolved. So he went immediately to the altar to be sacrificed, and the deed had been done if God had not opposed it. For he called loudly to Abraham by his name, and forbade him to slay his son, and said, It was not out of a desire of human blood that he was commanded to slay his son, nor was he willing that he should be taken away from him whom he had made his father, but to try the temper of his mind, whether he would be obedient to such a command. Since, therefore, he now was satisfied as to that, his alacrity, and the surprising readiness he showed in this, his piety, he was delighted in having bestowed such blessings upon him, and that he would not be wanting in all sort of concern about him, and in bestowing other children upon him, and that his son should live to a very great age, that he should live a happy life, and bequeath a large principality to his children, who should be good and legitimate. He foretold also that his family should increase into many nations, and that those patriarchs should leave behind them an everlasting name, that they should obtain the possession of the land of Canaan, and be envied by all men. When God had said this, he produced to them a ram, which did not appear before, for the sacrifice. So Abraham and Isaac, receiving each other unexpectedly, and having obtained the promises of such great blessings, embraced one another. And when they had sacrificed, they returned to Sarah, and lived happily together, God affording them his assistance in all things they desired. Chapter 14 Concerning Sarah, Abraham's wife, and how she ended her days. Now Sarah died a little while after, having lived one hundred and twenty-seven years. They buried her in Hebron, the Canaanites publicly allowing them a burying place, which piece of ground Abraham bought for four hundred shekels of Ephron, 
an inhabitant of Hebron. And both Abraham and his descendants built themselves sepulchres in that place. Chapter 15 How the nation of the Troglodytes were derived from Abraham by Keturah. Abraham, after this, married Keturah, by whom six sons were born to him, men of courage and of sagacious minds, Zambran and Jazar and Madan and Madian and Josabak and Sus. Now the sons of Sus were Sabathan and Dadan. The sons of Dadan were Latusim and Asur and Luom. The sons of Madiau were Ephes and Ophrin and Anak and Ebedes and Eldas. Now, for all these sons and grandsons, Abraham contrived to settle them in colonies, and they took possession of Troglodytus and the country of Arabia the Happy, as far as it reaches to the Red Sea. It is related of this Ophrin that he made war against Libya and took it, and that his grandchildren, when they inhabited it, called it, from his name, Africa. And indeed Alexander Polyhistor gives his attestation to what I here say, who speaks thus, Cleodemus the prophet, who was also called Malchus, who wrote a history of the Jews, in agreement with the history of Moses, their legislator, relates that there were many sons born to Abraham by Keturah, nay, he names three of them, Aphor, Surim, and Japhran, that from Surim was the land of Assyria denominated, and that from the other two, Aphor and Japhram, country of Africa took its name, because these men were auxiliaries to Hercules when he fought against Libya and Antaeus, and that Hercules married Aphra's daughter, and of her he begat a son, Deodorus, and that Sophon was his son, from whom that barbarous people called Sophatians were denominated. End of Book 1, Chapters 12-15 through 15. Recording by Hollis Hanover